It is my privilege to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Sohail Dalatzai. Dr. Dalatzai is associate professor uh, in the Department of Film and Media Studies and in the African American Studies program at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, he is the author of Black Star Crescent Moon, The Muslim International and Black Freedom Beyond America. He has also written a variety of essays appearing in such publications as Counterpunch and uh, Al Jazeera. Uh, his interest in hip hop and popular music has led to some interesting uh, tasks as well. He's written the liner notes to a new uh, series of DVDs called Freestyle, The Art of Rhyme. And he wrote the liner notes for the 20th anniversary reissue of the self-titled uh, debut album by Rage Against the Machine. If you would please join me in welcoming Dr. Delatsai and his talk to the East Blackwords, Islam and Muslims in the Black Radical Imagination. Welcome everybody, greetings of peace to everybody here. I appreciate you coming and uh, braving the weather. Well, at least for us Californians, this is something you have to brave. Um, maybe here, this is a nice day, I don't know. Um, but uh, I do appreciate you guys coming and uh, spending time and uh, allowing me to share with you. Uh, but I wanna first off also thank um, the Center for Global Humanities here at the University of New England, um, in particular uh, Anwar Majid, um, whose work uh, I'm deeply indebted to as well. It's informed much of my work and uh, many others who do work in the same area. Um, he's definitely a force and a figure to contend with and uh, we all appreciate his presence. I wish he could have been here today, but I know he's off in Morocco doing administrative things as they open up the, uh, the university there. So um, I also wanna thank Liz Bennett for helping to coordinate all of this and being so gracious with her time. So uh, my apologies for any difficulties in the coordination, but I thank you again for having me. Um, and again, to you all for being here. Um, so today, um, what I wanna do is talk to you all, I'm, and my understanding is this is like a seminar, and wh wh who are the students that are enrolled in the seminar, if you can give me a show of hands, okay? So the assumption here is that you've read the book. It's the assumption. Um, I'm a professor too, I know whether students read or not, so don't be surprised if I just call on you real quick and ask you to answer a question. Um, <laughs> but no, I won't do that. Well, maybe I will. Um, so, um, you know, I appreciate you guys coming, as I said, and I, what I'm gonna do is talking about, talk about um, some of the ideas that came and come out of my new book, uh, Black Star Crescent Moon, um, which is here. I'll be reading a little bit from it. Um, <clears throat> and it's really a book that in many ways looks at um, the prehistory uh, to 9-11, if you will. Um, and it looks in particular at the history of uh, the influence of Islam and uh, what I call in the book the Muslim Third World um, uh, on kind of black artists and activists um, in terms of how they imagine themselves, both politically, but also creatively and artistically. And I'll show you some, some of the things that I'm talking about. So the book in many ways is this prehistory. And, and uh, part of the reason why I wanted to focus on this history was that in particular after 9-11, I was speaking to, to Mary earlier um, during the reception, is that um, much of the, the, the attention, if you will, on, um, on Muslims or when you say Islam, tends to come from, or be, the, you know, the attention, be, the light tends to be shined on someone who looks like me. Um, and it, it tends to be, for lack of a better word, the immigrant Muslim, I put that in quotes, who comes from the so-called Middle East, right? Um, without, I think, um, and, and what that ignores, obviously, is the kind of history and sophistication and complexity uh, of black Muslims in the United States, right? Um, uh, uh, a, a group of people and a history and a set of traditions that have been in this country since the very beginning. In fact, uh, Sylvain Diouf and Richard Brent Turner and other scholars approximate that somewhere between 25 to 40 percent of the slaves that were brought to this country were Muslims, right? So that t to assume that Islam or Muslims is something new in the United States or that the presence 
of Islam or Muslims comes from the so-called Middle East, I think ignores this kind of incredible history of black Islam in the country. And so what I want to try and do is give you a sense of that history, uh, but do it um, by looking at, part, in particular, um, the last 40 or 50 years um, and the kind of really central role, if you will, that Islam came to play in kind of black politics and black cultural production. And, and you know, in particular, I'm talking about jazz, um, the black arts movement, um, hip hop culture, right? Uh, that many of the things that maybe we take for granted when thinking about these things, we don't conceive of Islam or Muslims being a part of it or central to creating it. And so what I wanted to do is give you a sense of it. And I go into obviously much more detail in the book. So, you know, I might give you a slightly more cursory overview of what's happening, but hopefully in the Q&A, uh, we can get into some more detail. Um, so I wanted to start by, of course, talking about the present, if you will. And when I say the present, um, I'm talking about, you know, the current president of the United States, Barack Hussein Obama, who uh, was reelected, of course, in 2012. But I wanted to take us back to the year 2008, where um, prior to the election, during even the primary, there was a lot of kind of, if you will, hysteria around uh, Obama's candidacy for a whole host of reasons. Um, but the primary or dominant thread tended to be whether or not he was a Muslim, right? Um, his middle name is Hussein, right? Um, he spent the majority of his childhood in Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world. His father was a Muslim. Um, his last name, Obama, la rhymes with Osama. This was actually thrown out by people, you know, as part of the link, right? Um, and so there was a tremendous amount of hysteria around whether he was a Muslim or not. And of course, you know, he avidly denied it. Um, he had to distance himself from Reverend Wright, um, who had married him and Michelle. Um, but to give you a sense again of uh, this, I had a slide for you to show. How many people remember this cover of The New Yorker, right? That came out in July of 2008, right? And, you know, as you can see in the, in the slide, right, and this is the cover of the New Yorker. It's a very controversial cover, as you can imagine. Um, but this is an image of them ostensibly in the, in the Oval Office, right? And if you look off to the right, you know, you see a picture of Osama bin Laden above the fireplace, right? If you look in the fireplace, there's an American flag burning, right? Um, Obama is there wearing uh, galabea or you know, and, and also wearing ship ship or chuppels, you know, the sandals. He's wearing a turban, of course, right? Michelle is dressed in the iconography of, you know, Angela Davis with the blowout afro. She has a rifle strapped to her chest and combat boots. And they're doing this kind of euphemistic kind of fist bump to suggest that, that you know, kind of the wink wink, like here we are in the Oval Office. This is who we really are. We got over on them. Right? They think we're one thing, we're you know, just African Americans, and, but this is who we really are. Michelle, the black radical feminist, and Obama, the kind of Arabian candidate of the 21st century, right? this kind of closet Muslim. Right? And so this was part of the hysteria that surrounded Obama. And it was really interesting to me to think about what this meant, because if you fast forward even, Two years after this, almost two years after this, August of 2010, after he'd already been elected, right? He'd already been vetted, if you will, by the democratic process in the United States. You know, a Pew poll came out, and I talk about this in the book, an August 10, 2010 Pew poll came out that showed that 61% of Americans uh, believed that Obama was or might be a Muslim, right? That he was or might be a Muslim. Right? Not, not, I didn't say 61% of the Tea Party or 61% of the Republican Party. 61% of Americans thought that Obama was or might be a Muslim, that this specter still hung over him, right? even after he had been elected. And as I write about in the book, 
this was really a deeper seated fear, you know, within kind of US political culture around the legacy of Malcolm X. This kind of connection between blackness and Islam was really what this deeper seated anxiety was about. Um, and, you know, while it might seem like I'm grasping at straws when I say this, right, um, I want to read from you the beginning of my book where I reference um, Senator Dianne Feinstein. Senator Feinstein introduced Obama, right, at, uh, before his inauguration in 2009, you know, January 2009 is when he was inaugurated. It was co coinciding, of course, with the national holiday, national celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Um, and so, you know, on the mall on Washington, there was more people that day than had even amassed during King's I Have a Dream speech, right? This was like the inauguration of the first black president. Um, and Feinstein is introducing Obama, right? And I just want to read briefly um, what she was saying because, again, um, I don't want, you know, I, I, you know, and my jaw dropped when I, when I heard this because, again, in my mind, based on the work that I was doing and thinking about, um, this connection or this fear of black and, blackness and Islam being together um, or this, this idea that somehow this was about Malcolm X, maybe I was just making something up. Right? Maybe this was just in my head. Maybe this was just some esoteric idea that some scholar or researcher comes up with and then runs with it and makes something bigger than it is. Um, until I heard Diane Feinstein speak. Right? So I'm gonna, this is again how I open my book. So I'm just gonna read very briefly. Um, um, Feinstein, I wrote that a key and telling moment occurred when Senator Diane Feinstein of California gave the introductory remarks at the inauguration saying, quote, now I'm quoting Feinstein, those who doubt the supremacy of the ballot over the bullet can never diminish the power engendered by nonviolent struggles for justice and equality, like the one that made this day possible, right? End quote. I go on to say, uh, Feinstein continued saying that future <coughs> generations would, quote, this is Feinstein again, look back and remember that this was the moment that the dream that once echoed across history from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial finally reached, reached the walls of the White House, right? Now, I don't know if anybody caught the references that were being made there, right? Those who doubt the supremacy of the ballot over the bullet. How many people know what I'm referring to? Right? Okay, no. So Malcolm X, his most famous speech was a speech called The Ballot or the Bullet. He made two of them in 1964, one in Detroit, one in Cleveland, right? And it's arguably his most iconic speech. If King's was I Have a Dream, although, and I'll talk about this, I think it tends to be King's Beyond Vietnam speech. That's my favorite King speech. Malcolm's was the ballot or the bullet. And here you have Feinstein referencing Malcolm's speech, but not just referencing Malcolm's speech, she's in, in fact dismissing Malcolm's speech, right? Those who doubt the supremacy of the ballot over the bullet, right? Um, you know, and she, she invokes King's dream and the nonviolent struggles that made this day possible. So here you have, in this kind of high moment of American political theater, where the first black president is being inaugurated on the national holiday that celebrates King's birthday, you have Malcolm X kind of conjured, if you will, only to be then somehow exercised or excised from kind of the national past. Because again, this was kind of haunting Obama, right? And not only that, and I'll, and I'll get into the details of it, it was about centering a discourse call around civil rights, right? This idea by invoking King, by celebrating it on the day of King's birthday, the, Obama's inauguration being on, on the day of King's birthday, uh, coinciding with his birthday, and the election of a black president, right, was all kind of a way of celebrating the narrative and discourse of civil rights in America, right? That, in fact, it was the civil rights movement and the civil rights struggles that made the election of Obama possible, right? So you have King kind of triumphantly positioned and Malcolm invoked, but only to be dismissed, right? And to me, I found this very interesting on this day for this to be taking place, right? And again, we'll talk about how the United States has come to, in many ways, ossify Dr. King, uh, looking at kind of 1963 
Martin Luther King and celebrating that image of him and not the 1967-68 King, the one who was assassinated for his political beliefs. Remember, King comes out against the Vietnam War in the Beyond Vietnam speech. How many people have heard his Beyond Vietnam speech? Right, a couple of people. It's on YouTube. Just Google it. You can listen to it, right? Um, but similarly, like, you see that with Mandela, right? I mean, Mandela now is being framed as this, like, transformative figure, right? This uniter of people. When, in fact, you know, up until 2008, Mandela was on the terrorist watch list in the United States, right? The CIA are the ones who were responsible for him getting captured. They gave the tip that got him captured and put him in jail for 27 years. And Mandela was somebody who used and argued for the use of armed struggle to liberate the people of South Africa, right? So, but, so the, but, but there's a very different image of Mandela being promoted now that ignores who he really was, right? And I think similarly something has happened around Dr. King. And we can maybe get into some of those details. But in, it, I say all that to say that despite that history, there's a par particular image that's being promoted around civil rights in the United States. And so what I want to talk to you about right now, very briefly before I get into some of the details um, as I move through the book, is well, what it, why is civil rights so central to the American imagination? Why is it so central to American national identity? Why is it constantly being invoked? In fact, today it's common to hear the word colorblind, right, or the post-racial. Right? America's in a post-racial moment, right? Um, and much of, all of that has to do with the idea that the civil rights bills were passed in 64 and 65, and gains were made, black people can now vote, and de jure forms of segregation. That is to say, no laws on the book exclude black people from America. But it, of course, it doesn't account for de facto forms of segregation, like what in reality is happening, right? So. There's a celebration of civil rights, and, and, and why? There's a whole host of reasons. Because one, the, the narrative of civil rights, one, suggests that America has in many ways reached its kind of promise, right? That more perfect union has been formed because on the, in terms of legally, all forms of segregation and racism have been stripped from the law books, right? Civil rights, if you understand the history, the narrative of civil rights also under it also underscores, you know, ideas around mass mobilization, protest, pulling on the levers of power, right? Legally, constitutionally, through the executive branch, right? It's all about the machinery of American politics at work to form that more perfect union, right? And so, civil rights, in many ways, conforms, you know, or brings to the front many of these concerns, and so. It's no wonder then that it's so celebrated in many ways, as I talk about in the, the book, it's kind of the master narrative of the United States, civil rights, right? It's held up as like this high moment for the United States. And so the question for us then is, what is civil rights? Why is it that it's so celebrated? What did it come out of? And I asked this question, why civil rights again, to, br to get back to the issue of Malcolm X and the role of Islam and Muslims within black political culture, right? So I want to shift now slightly to talk about, well, what, where did civil rights come from? It didn't just drop from the sky. What did it emerge out of, right? And, and in order to do this, we have to go back to the Cold War. How many people here under the age of 40 know what the Cold War is? OK, good, all right? Um, so the Cold War, I asked some of my students that, and they're like, Cold War, yeah, I'm not really quite sure what that is, right? So, so it was this struggle against communism, right? Anti-communism, right? And so I have to go back to the post-World War II moment, right? So right after World War II ends, right? This is the so-called Great War, the war against fascism, right? Um, what happens, though, is, of course, black soldiers come back to a still segregated America. And they're question, they start to question themselves. And I talk about this in the book. Like, well, wait a minute. I thought master race philosophy was destroyed in the war. We're coming right back home to it. There's segregated lunch counters, segregated you know, drinking fountains, et cetera, et cetera. What's going on here, right? And so what started to emerge out of black political culture immediately after, before World War II, but especially after when the, contra the contradictions became more apparent, 
was um, black people began to align themselves and see themselves internationally. They started to connect themselves to the anti-colonial movements that were taking place in the third world. Because as a result of World War II, much of what is referred to as the third world was being colonized by Europe. But because Europe was decimated as a result of the war, it loosened their hold on their colonies in Middle East, Africa, Asia, like India, Pakistan, Uganda, Kenya, North Africa, you name it, right? So se after centuries of control of the third world, this was starting to get loosened because of the, the destruction of World War II. And so people in those countries continued to struggle for their freedom. And black people saw themselves in relationship to that. They saw, as they framed it, white supremacy as this global phenomenon. It wasn't just affecting us here in the United States. This was something that was controlling the non-white world. And we, we see our freedom as connected to the freedom of the peoples of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Right? So this was like the common discourse, and I talk about this in the book, within black political culture. Right? And it began to kind of really take hold. But in 1947, Truman, President Truman declared uh, through the Truman Doctrine uh, that communism was public enemy number one, right? And that anti-communism was going to define US foreign policy. That is to say that they, uh, the United States saw communism as a threat to the post-war order and the security and stability of the post-war order. And so it said, anywhere where there's communism, we're going to go in there and stamp it out. We will either start wars because of it. We will fund you know, uh, opposition groups. We will, as they did in some cases, even overthrow democratically elected leaders. So if you look at Iran, for example, and with Mossadegh in 52, Operation Ajax, in 1954, Arbenz in Guatemala, right? If you go to 1959, Patrice Lumumba was assassinated by the CIA, right? So if you go through the history of the early part of the Cold War in particular, and of course, this lead, the, the Korean War was fought over this fear of anti-communism, so was the Vietnam War. So anti-communism came to kind of, in many ways, define U.S. statecraft. But this had a tremendous effect, not only on the third world, but also domestically. Because the US's assumption when it came to the third world was communism is a bigger threat to the third world than colonialism. Right? Communism is a bigger threat to the third world than colonialism. That is to say the United States felt that the third world should remain under colonial rule. That would be better than them having to live with communism. So what the United States ended up doing was underwriting the colonial powers hold over their own colonies. Right? So they essentially prevented full-fledged liberation from taking place because they felt again that if those countries were freed, a vacuum would be created and communism would find and take a hold there and it would threaten US interests. So this was the kind of geopolitical kind of calculus the United States made. Domestically, of course, this had a huge chilling effect. Also, anybody who was deemed a communist through the Smith Act was persecuted and put in jail. You know, you know the McCarthy hearings, I'm sure all of you are familiar with, right? The imprisonment, some committed suicide over it. It had a tremendous impact in Hollywood in terms of filmmaking. There was this idea that the communists have infiltrated, right? They're working in Hollywood. They're working in corporations. You know, they're working in the newspapers, and they're going to be planting ideas that are going to turn America red, so the logic went, right? So not only was this a kind of a widespread fear, but it also affected black politics, so that what was dominant within black political culture, like I was saying before, this idea that black people were connected to the third world, right? This fractured the black left, as I call it in the book, right? It fractured the black left, right? And what broke off from the mainstream, they, they broke, the, the majority broke off, the major five, many of the five, major five organizations broke off, and they decided, right, they made this kind of compromise deal with the United States. Now remember, 
Lynching was a national sport in many ways still. There was no anti-lynching law in the United States at the time. Interstate transportation was segregated. Education was still segregated, right? Public housing was still segregated, right? So these black activists said, okay, you know, and they met with Truman and the Civil Rights Commission and they made this kind of compromise. They said, we are your Achilles heel in your fight against communism abroad. How you treat us is going to determine how effective you are in the third world. They won't trust you. They've lived under centuries of white rule and colonialism. They're very skeptical of it. The Soviet press is very good at propagating and promoting the idea of when, when Emmett Till and, and, and racial violence was taking place in the United States, that was promoted all over the third world to say don't trust the United States, right? So the United States agreed with this. Truman, Dulles, the kind of architects of American power at the time recognized, and I, and I have some quotes that I can pull from, they recognized the kind of limitations here, right? That they were under if they didn't address the treatment of black people domestically. So a deal was made by these black leaders, by black leadership, that said, okay, you pass an anti-lynching law, you desegregate housing, education, and transportation, and we will support your anti-communist foreign policy. Right? We will support your anti-communist foreign policy. And I want to read briefly like some of the quotes from these people, right? So Adam Clayton Powell, right? Congressman out of New York who was very kind of savvy. You know, he wrote, you know, quote, he said, one dark face from the United States is as of much value as millions of dollars in economic aid to the third world. He's talking about the image of black people in the, uh, uh, in representing the United States is as valuable as millions of dollars of economic aid, right? Um, Ralph Bunch, another huge towering figure, right? He argued that, he said that, quote, the legend of America as a liberalizing force in world affairs would and could be established if carefully chosen Negroes could prove more effective, because carefully chosen Negroes could prove more effective than whites, owing to their unique ability to gain more readily the confidence of the native. He's talking about the third world. So for them, there was this, I, rep, there was this representational potential that black people had in being projected abroad to show that America was this racially egalitarian place. And so this compromise deal got made. There were, there were promises made to these black leaders that these bills would pass through Congress. Of course, it took almost 18 years before any semblance of them was passed. Of course, Brown v. Board was passed in 54, but it wasn't even implemented, as we all know, with Alabama and whatnot that took place, right? It took the, coast, the National Guard to be sent in to, to have schools desegregated in the South, right? Eisenhower, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy had a hard time convincing Southern Democrats to pass this legislation. But I, but I say all that to say that when this black left split, right, the, those who made the compromise, if you will, with the US state became what we now refer to as civil rights. This was the civil rights movement. They aligned themselves with a kind of expansionist US foreign policy abroad, anti-communist foreign policy, in exchange for concessions and the passing of legislation to end racial violence domestically. All under the logic of Negroes are Americans too. Penny Von Eschen is a historian. She wrote a book called Race Against Empire, which really details this, right? Negroes are Americans too. And you know we see our fate as tied to the fate of America and America's enemies are our enemies, right? And as you can see, you can imagine this fractured this black left. It didn't eliminate them because there was still a vibrant black left that existed. Paul Robeson, although he was persecuted, his passport was stolen. W.B. Du Bois, same with him. In fact, he relinquished his passport and his US citizenship and died on the same day as the March on Washington in 1963. He kind of got swept under the rug because it happened on this kind of momentous day. But W.B. Du Bois and a whole host of other black activists, including, of course, as we're now going to talk about, Malcolm X. Right? Malcolm was a part of this black left. And the Nation of Islam was also a huge part in opposing this civil rights project. They said, wait a minute. We as black people, we see ourselves 
not as a national minority, but as part of a global majority, right? We identify with the oppressed around the world. And we are going to struggle against and be in solidarity with those in the third world. Because we see, again, this idea of white supremacy and white power as a global phenomenon. It's not just happening here domestically, right? So Malcolm, as I talk about in the book, you know, as a part of the Nation of Islam, he's meeting with delegates from all over the third world. He's taking trips abroad in 1959, even while he was in the Nation of Islam, right? And what I, what I want to do is like kind of underscore the kind of central role that Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam played within black politics. And, and it's important to understand why and to think about what, what did black Islam mean at this particular moment. You know, th there's this idea of the conversion narrative, right? Why did black people convert, right? And the idea runs something like this, that black people had their history and cultures and traditions taken from them. In fact, they didn't even know their name. They had their master's name, right? So the guy's name was John Washington. So if you were black, your name might be John Washington. Or in the case of Malcolm, his name was Malcolm Little, right? He's like, Little, I don't, that was the name of my slave, my family's slave master. So that's the name I have. I'm defined in relationship to my white master, not who I was or who my family was before. So what they decided to do as part of their conversion narrative was to embrace this idea of the X, the unknown. We don't know who we are. So it was, a, it was a, in many ways, it was a rejection of the authority that whiteness could have over not just the black present, but also the black past. Like, you don't have authority over me. I'm not going to take be named by you. And you don't have authority over a black future. We are going to chart and narrate our own future through this the idea of a conversion narrative. And so they took on then an Arabic name, what they called their original name. Right, so for Malcolm, it became uh, Malik al-Shabazz. Of course, the original name is problematic because it doesn't get at how Islam came to West Africa. Right, who were they before Islam came to West Africa? That still doesn't address it. But for them, this was a kind of symbolic reclaiming of a past that was not only before America, who we were before America, but also beyond America. So they saw themselves as not only before America, but beyond America what Amiri Baraka called, you know, the black arts poet and writer, a Muslim identity was post-American in a way, right? So this conversion narrative was very powerful, right? In terms of like redefining black people's relationship, one, to the United States, but two, to the larger non-white world, right? And, and, and so this began to take traction and hold within black communities in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, right? So, you know, I'll just, you know, go through a little bit and we can talk, you know. So I just put up some, some pictures here. And this is the chapter I call Malcolm X and the Third World Rising. It's chapter one. And here's just some images. So here's Malcolm in Cairo, Egypt, right? There's Malcolm down here in Ghana. Anybody recognize who he's with? What's that? Sorry, the one down here on the left. That's Maya Angelou. She was in Ghana at the time, working and living there, and she was Malcolm's kind of guide when he was in Ghana. She had lived there for a while. That's Maya Angelou in Ghana, Malcolm in Ghana. This is Malcolm in Nigeria on his travels abroad, right? And then, of course, here's an image of Malcolm with Muhammad Ali shortly after he had converted. I'll talk about Ali briefly in a, in a minute, right? But this is, again, uh, I wanted to show you that, as I talk about in the book, that the conversion of, to Islam, but also the politics of the Muslim third world came to play a central role in not just Malcolm's, but black people's political imagination. They started to identify with the struggles in, for example, Algeria, their anti-colonial resistance against the French. Or Egypt, right? Gamal Abdel Nasser became kind of a hero. Egypt was kind of both African and, you know, Middle Eastern or Asian as it's called. Middle East is a problematic term, it's Asian, right? It was both African and Asian, right? So Egypt played a central role, right? In fact, Gamal Abdel Nasser came to Harlem at the same time that Fidel Castro had come, 
and Malcolm met Castro in the Hotel Teresa in 1959, right? And you know, Malcolm became very outspoken about what happened to Patrice Lumumba, you know? So Malcolm, in many ways, as I talk about in the book, he, he said Islam was the greatest unifying force in the world, in the dark world today, right? He saw it as the kind of most common theme. And so I talk about the central role that, for example, the Bandung Conference played. This was the first conference of a uh, meeting of the non-white world in Bandung, Indonesia. And Malcolm talks about it in the message to the grassroots speech. Right? I also talk about how Malcolm writes a letter in the Egyptian Gazette in support of the Palestinian cause. Right? So there's a whole history of Malcolm and his relationship to what I call the Muslim third world. Right? And these are just some examples of it. Right? But this history, as a result of Malcolm and the kind of politics that he was kind of trying to push forth, challenged this civil rights orthodoxy that saw black people as American and domesticated them, as Penny Von Eschen talks about. It domesticated black politics. Negroes are Americans. And their fate was tied to US, the United States. So the America's enemies became black people's enemies, right? And we can get into kind of like the complexity of that, right? And so I'll stop here for a second, but you can begin to see why then when Obama is inaugurated, civil rights is promoted and Malcolm is in many ways shunned or marginalized. Because again, civil rights presumes that black people have a place in American society, an equal place in American society, that their future and destiny is tied to American society. And here's Obama, this black president, that in many ways embodied that. When in fact, Malcolm in his speech to Ballot or the Bullet was arguing against the idea of electoral participation at that time. He wasn't anti-democratic, he was saying, look, in the current configuration of power in the United States, particularly where the South is dominating, our vote is meaningless. We're just going to be used by one political party, right? We're, they're gonna get our vote, but we're gonna get nothing in return. So we have to look toward other means, and this is why Malcolm went from civil rights to human rights, he made this distinction. He's like, civil rights, you're still under the boot of Uncle Sam, and you have to deal through the Congress. And he's like, that's limited for us. We have to take our cause to the United Nations. And this is what Malcolm's whole political project was, internationalizing the plight of black people in the United States to the United Nations, right? And I talk about in the book how in 64, he goes to Cairo, Egypt to make a speech at the Organization of African States, you know, asking them to support him in bringing the case of African Americans to the United Nations, right? So this is, again, part of the reason why Obama and Feinstein invoke Malcolm and to dismiss him. And again, because Malcolm is challenging some very fundamental tenets about black people's relationship in the United States, right? So this is kind of, you know, Malcolm, of course. And, you know, I go on then talking about after Malcolm is assassinated, he had a huge influence, you know, on the formation of what became black power. You know, um, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale said that Malcolm was the architect, the intellectual and political architect, if you will, of the Black Panther Party, right? And in fact, they, began, they, they decided to form the party soon after his assassination. So my chapter two really looks at how the Muslim third world was shaped, helped to shape kind of a black power imagination, right? And so the, the image on the far left up there is an image from the Black Panther newspaper of uh, Eldridge Cleaver and Emery Douglas um, in Algiers at the first Pan-African uh, Arts Conference, right, that had taken place in 1969, right? Just to give you a sense, right? The second picture right there in the middle, top middle, is Huey Newton shaking hands with Yasser Arafat at the time, right? He went to Palestine to go meet with them in solidarity, right? Um, and so, I bring this up because in this chapter, I talk about the influence of Algeria on the black power imagination. And I do it by talking about one, the figure of Franz Fanon, whose book, The Wretched of the Earth, in many ways, was uh, written about his time during the Algerian resistance to the French. In fact, you know, the, the Black Panther Party had set up, they said that their first official embassy that they had set up, the international embassy of the Black Panther Party was in Algiers, Algeria. Algeria had become this kind of symbol for the third world of anti-colonial resistance. How many people have seen the film The Battle of Algiers? Okay, just one, it's, one of, it's an incredible film. 
Um, it's, it's what my next book is on. It's kind of like a, a favorite. It got shown by the Pentagon in 2004 um, to the generals as a way of doing counterinsurgency. But the film came out in 66, 67, and it kind of sought to kind of give voice, and cinematically at least, to the Algerian resistance to the French. And, and this became a very influential film throughout the Third World, including the Black Panthers. This is why there was such an affinity with Algeria, but also because of the work of Frantz Fanon, who was a kind of theorist of colonialism and what it meant for the colonized, right? So Fanon was like, you know, very, very influential in terms of black power politics. So Algeria became to play a central role. But I put this other stuff up because, like, for example, James Baldwin. I talk about James Baldwin's time in Paris. And Baldwin is there in Paris, and he sees the treatment of Algerians, how they're being treated at the hands of the French. And he says that the Algerian and the black person in America have something in common in terms of their oppression. So again, he's making this connection here, right? Um, Tony Cade Bambara's anthology, The Black Woman, has several essays in there, but one of which I talk about was by a woman named Francie Covington. And she wrote a piece, can the techniques of the Battle of Algiers be used in Harlem, right? Can they be used as an analog for freeing black women in particular, right? So again, Algeria is invoked, right? This novel up here by William Gardner Smith called The Stone Face, right, is this novel about this fictional character who leaves Philadelphia after being attacked by racists and decides to go to Paris, thinking that Paris is this kind of utopic place of exile for black people. They'll be treated better over there. This was kind of the idea and why many jazz writers, jazz musicians and writers went there. But when they went they, there, they of course saw a different reality. They were in many ways celebrated as American artists, as black artists, but they saw the way Algerians and West Africans were being treated. And they said, wait a minute, this isn't the Paris or France that we thought. And so they started to make different kinds of connections. And The Stone Face is a novel that really gets at that. It talks about this character who starts to realize these contradictions. So I, I talk about that in the book as well, right? And so Black Power and the Black Panther Party were intimately shaped by the politics of the Muslim Third World. I then go on to talk about, of course, the Battle of Algiers, the film I talk about, and its influence. I spend then some time talking about uh, these two novels, uh, one, one of which became a film, The Spook Who Sat By The Door. How many people have seen this? It's on Google Video. You can watch it. It was actually pulled out of the theater by the FBI after three weeks for its controversial politics. But it was, the novel that it was based upon was written also by Sam Greenlee. And I've interviewed him, and I've become close with Sam. He spent time in the late 50s in Iraq as part of the U.S. Embassy. And the novel Baghdad Blues kind of is almost autobiographical. And he talks about his representational potential, quote unquote, that the Americans saw him, um, the role he could play in, in Iraq, right? That the Iraqis could then trust the Americans because they had a black man working in the CIA with them or the US Embassy. So I talk about the influence of that, right? But I also talk about the influence of the politics of the Muslim third world on the films of the LA Rebellion School. They came out of Los Angeles, Charles Burnett, Haile Garima, Julie Dash, a whole host of black filmmakers that were influenced by a film like The Battle of Algiers that inaugurated this movement known as third cinema, this alternative to dominant Hollywood cinema and second cinema coming out of Europe. It was the cinema of the oppressed in a way. That's how they, you know, they saw it, the marginalized. Cinema that could give voice to our thoughts and feelings, right? And so the LA Rebellion School was this group of black independent filmmakers that were deeply influenced by a film like The Battle of Algiers, right? And I talk about how this film movement was shunned by Hollywood because of its kind of cinematic techniques. In fact, I talk about how Hollywood instead embraced what became known to be black exploitation films. How many people know what black exploitation films are? Superfly, The Mac, Dolomite, right? These kind of caricatured images of blackness as pimps and hustlers on the street right, that in many ways undermined the politics that were taking place in black, polit amongst, in black communities at the time. It celebrated, you know, to make a contemporary example, the bling, right, like hip hop today, at the expense of actual black political mobilization. It made caricatures of black people instead of portraying characters in a film, right? And so I talk about how Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song, which was kind of the first film that kind of you know, Hollywood saw it was an independently made film. No Hollywood studio wanted to make it. But he put it out independently and it made a ton of money. 
And Hollywood saw a formula then and decided to then make black exploitation. But Sweets, but Van Peebles' film became a touchstone and a debate where Huey Newton of the Black Panther Party called it the official black power film. Every Black Panther should go see it. And Lerone Bennett, this other cultural critic, writes this piece challenging Huey Newton's idea that this is a black power film. He's, and Lerone Bennett, and I talk about this in the critique, says, no, the real black power film is the Battle of Algiers. And Ali Lapointe in the Battle of Algiers is like Malcolm X. And that's the film we should look to. So I talk about how within debates about cultural politics around cinematic representation, right? Again, the Battle of Algiers and the Muslim Third World are kind of invoked. Malcolm was invoked in Bennett's argument as well, right? So this is kind of to give you a sense of what I do in that chapter. Um, and, and I go on then because what happens then in the book, there's kind of like a break in kind of like US politics. And I know I'm running out of time, so I'll speed it up again. But there was this moment post-Black Power, the post-Civil Rights era, um, where you know, the, the emergence of what came to be known as the black criminal, right? The, crim the war on crime, the war on drugs kind of em emerges in the early 70s through Nixon. And it's the rise of the prison as a way of kind of containing or undermining black political mobilization, right? And there's a whole bunch of people who've written on it, Michelle Alexander and the new Jim Crow, she's written on this, right? How in many ways the prison has become the, the, the new form of Jim Crow because it strips black people. Anybody in prison loses their voting rights, any federal benefit to financial aid, et cetera, right? Um, and if you read the 14th Amendment of the United States, it said that prison is banned, sorry, slavery is banned in the United States except in the case of pr incarceration, right? So Michelle Alexander is a lawyer and she writes about how the prison, the massive explosion of the prison population post black power um, is a result of you know, this threat of the black criminal. But I write about this in the context that at the same time in the early 70s of US foreign policy was the emergence of the so-called Muslim terrorist. The United States is starting to expand into the Muslim world deeply and this, this, the, the OPEC wars, the Iran hostage crisis, all these things are happening where in the early to mid 70s, you know, and into the late 70s, the Muslim terrorist emerges. So I talk about these two figures, the black criminal and the Muslim terrorist, right? And it then leads to a whole discussion I have about Islam, about hip hop and Islam. But in that chapter, I talk about the presence of Islam even within jazz. Because you know, jazz is seen as kind of the precursor to hip hop in many ways, right? So here's some examples, for example, of the relationship of, so Art Blakey, you can see the iconography, a night in Tunisia, Art Blakey had converted to Islam, right? Um, Ahmed Abdul Malik, right? The Eastern sounds of him, he was a oud player, right? One of my favorites albums, Ahmad Jamal, uh, the Awakening, he was, uh, album has been sampled a ton of times in hip hop, and he was the only guy to turn Miles Davis down. Um, he said, yeah, I'm doing my own thing, right? Yusuf Latif, of course, his album Eastern Sounds, he had converted as well. Randy Weston, jazz pianist, right, who had also converted. Um, here's another Yusuf Latif record, right, Prayer to the East, right? And I put Coltrane's A Love Supreme on there because um, if you read the liner notes, to the, 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 the sleeve to Coltrane's A Love Supreme, um, the, the, the English translation, he just does it in English, is the opening verses of the Quran, right? In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful, right? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, right? He's, he's quoting from the opening of the Quran. And he says, as some have argued in A Love Supreme, I'm not so sure about this, but some have argued that when you hear the song, how many people have heard A Love Supreme, right? He says toward the end, a love supreme. He says it 19 times, a sacred number in Islam. But toward the end of the, by, the, by about the 15th time, he's saying Allah supreme, Allah's great, Allah Akbar, right? So there's this whole history of Coltrane and his relationship to Islam. So it's kind of contested and debated a little bit, but what's clear is that in the liner notes, he's quoting from the opening of the Quran, right? So I just put that up there. But this again starts to show how even amongst artists, this was a central part of their artistic imagination, right? And then, of course, people also talk about the black arts movement in relationship to hip hop. So jazz and then the black arts movement. Black arts movement was this movement of poets, writers, um, theater, uh, involved in theater as well, who saw art as part of raising social consciousness, right? And Amiri Baraka and Larry Neal and Sonia Sanchez and a whole host of people were involved in this endeavor. Bless you. And so I just put up some of the kind of iconic um, uh, 
you know, titles and things from that I talk about in the book. So the Black is Beautiful album that came out on Jihad Records that Amiri Baraka had started, right? Um, his soundtrack that he had done uh, called a, for, for the play A Black Mass. A, a Black Mass was the Nation of Islam's play about the kind of founding of the white race, quote unquote, right? And so he does the soundtrack for it, right? Of course, Gwendolyn Brooks, her poetry book in the Mecca, right? Um, the last poets who were seen as the godfathers of hip hop, if you will, um, who members who had converted to Islam, right? The Black Fire Anthology, which is kind of replete with kind of black poets who had converted as well. And then, of course, Marvin X's book, Fly to Allah, right? So you, again, this is part of the kind of inheritance that had kind of happened in this period, right? Which of course then gets us to hip hop, right? Now most people don't know, and I'll go through this rather quickly because we're running out of time, but most people don't know that, you know, when we talk about hip hop, like what people often refer to, especially for people my age, old people like me, um, who grew up on hip hop, there's always this conversation about, oh man, you know, hip hop today is just awful, it's whack, it's terrible, right? Back in the day, it was so much better, right? So there's just always this, this kind of decline narrative, right? And what we often invoke is this period called the golden age, right, of hip hop, which is roughly 84 to nine, 85 to 94, 1985 to 94. And as I talk about in the book, this period, without exception almost, almost without exception, I mean, there's few artists, but of the, of the artists who were identified with the period, and I'll show you some of them, identified with Islam in one way or another and we're Muslim, and I'll go through some of them, right? So of course, here's the first 1983 Keith LeBlanc 12 inch of the, you know, Malcolm X, no sellout. And, and Malcolm is kind of, he's, he's the most sampled voice in all of hip hop. You know, his voice was sampled, his speeches throughout hip hop. So again, Malcolm came to play this central role, and of course, this presence of Malcolm culminates in Spike Lee's 1992 biopic on Malcolm, right? Uh, because all the X hats and the X cups, Malcolm became this kind of figure he embodied in many ways the so-called black criminal and the so-called Muslim terrorist that was circulating in American culture at the time, right? And so black youth kind of circulated around Malcolm. Malcolm became this kind of prophet of hip hop, if you will. I show you here the early Source magazine. Yeah, there, there were these things called magazines that you could actually hold back in the day. Um, the Source magazine's cover, an Islamic summit. Um, they had a whole review of a whole host of artists in here, right? Um, this is Lakim Shabazz, right? His album, The Lost Tribe of Shabazz. And you can see some of the iconography here. Um, and you can Google some of these artists and their videos are up online. Lakim Shabazz is one in particular, right? Um, here's some other ones just to give you. Brand Nubian, one of my favorite groups, their album, Allah Akbar, right? Uh, that's, sorry, One for All is their album, right? That's another one of their 12 inches. Poor Righteous Teachers, right? X-Clan, Eric B and Rakim, right? Um, and of course, Public Enemy, right? Um, here's more kind of, that was the eight, late 80s period. This is the early 90s period. Here's one of my favorite albums, um, Gangstar. The cover Daily Operation has Premier, the producer on the typewriter with, again, a photo of Malcolm in the background, right? Um, Pete Rock and CL Smooth, their album is called Mecca and the Soul Brother. And I took my chapter title from their song, Return of the Mecca, right? There's a screen grab of Gangstar, Guru from Gangstar, during the video for the Manifest song, where they sampled Art Blakey's Night in Tunisia, right? And you can see he's kind of embodying Malcolm in the video, right? Of course, you have the Wu-Tang Clan, um, Ice Cube's Death Certificate album, right? Um, and then one of my favorite albums, Diggable Planets Blowout Comb, which is kind of a slept on record for you hip hop heads if you don't know, buy this record, or download it, or whatever it is that you do. Um, and then, of course, it just moves into like the 90s and the native tongues, which involve Tribe Called Quest, Queen Latifah, De La Soul, Black Sheep, Far Side. This is a whole collective called the Native Tongues. And of course, Black Star, Mos Def, and Talib Kweli, um, who are also affiliated with this collective right here. Again, so all these groups were converts to Islam, right? Of course, this is a collective known as the Ummah, the Arabic world, word for a worldwide community. They call themselves the Uma again, to show you again. This is Tribe Called Quest, Raphael Sadiq, the great Jay Dilla, um, and D'Angelo, um, who I hope his album comes out very soon. But this was part of this group here, right? And then, of course, as I write, newish jacks, right? These are more contemporary artists, right? So, of course, you have 
the back cover to Yasin Bey's album, The Ecstatic, which is a picture of the Moorish Science Temple, the top left, right? Um, Freeway and Beanie Siegel out of Philadelphia, right? Jaziri X, who's around today and making incredible music, if you don't know about Jaziri X. There's a picture of Yasin Bey, or Most Deaf, as he's kind of more popularly known. Um, J Electronica, right, there at the Sphinx, right? Lupe Fiasco, of course, down here at the bottom, right? Um, Shabazz Palaces, they come out of the Northwest uh, Seattle area, right? You know, um, Odyssey out of Washington, D.C. And then who knows this image on the left, in the yellow in the middle? Anybody know this picture? Well, so it's the, root, it's, it's the Roots' album cover for Tipping Point, their album Tipping Point. Anybody know the picture? Malcolm X. Yeah, this is Malcolm's prison photo. This is his mugshot. So again, Malcolm comes back, right? It's, it's this moment where Malcolm, the moment where it's his tipping point, Malcolm's tipping point. He goes from the hustler who gets arrested as he goes into jail and converts and becomes who we now know as Malcolm X, right? Right? So again, Malcolm kind of gets invoked and brought back, right? So I think I talk about this presence of how these Muslim artists kind of in hip hop kind of was this voice for speaking back against this kind of prison regime and the war on crime and the war on drugs, this criminalization of blackness, right? But as a result of that, as I talk about in the book, in the, in the early to mid 90s uh, and the rise of Malcolm X, we also saw a simultaneous embrace of a figure like Muhammad Ali. When I talk about how this emerged just at the time when Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations thesis was taking off, right? This idea of this internal conflict between the Muslim world and the West. Um, and also the culture wars in America, where the 60s were being rewritten, right? And so Ali came to embody not only the 60s moment, right? There's this whole idea that the 60s led to, for example, the 1992 LA uprisings. The 60s led to the decline of, of the United States, right? And there was this whole assault on rewriting the 60s in a way. And so I talk about how Ali became this figure that was embraced as this national hero in many ways, right? Of course, he's silent and kind of muted. He can't speak the way Ali could speak back. But he became this kind of symbol, right? And so I, I show an older photo of Ali at the pyramids in Egypt. But then he's named Athlete of the Century in the late 90s by GQ, right? He lights, the, of course, the Olympic flame in 96. This was kind of his coming out party, if you will. He's been given the Medal of Honor, Presidential Medal of Honor by, by George Bush II. And this is in the 90s with, with the Clintons. And of course, he was Obama's special guest at his 2008 presidency too. So Ali has come to kind of be embraced as this kind of American national hero. And I talk about in the book how this was a way of kind of, in many ways, co-opting the presence of Malcolm in some ways, right? And kind of challenging and kind of aligning kind of Ali's previous politics in the way that civil rights was to the American project, right? That is to say that um, we have to thank Ali because without him, we wouldn't be who we are, right? And so it assumes in this kind of, kind of evolutionary like narrative about kind of American democracy. So um, I kind of close on that. I do talk about kind of the, the, the place of the prison and the kind of the crackdown on black Muslims in prison in the United States um, and what that means, especially because of the rise of Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib and those kinds of things and how the prison has come, become this place where kind of Islam is being watched, if you will, um, for fear of another Malcolm emerging, right? Um, so that, that's in many ways the kind of, you know, uh, long survey overview of the book. And, um, you know, I know I've been speaking for a little bit, so I'll, I'll cut it short, but I want to open up for any questions that you all might have. Um, but I really appreciate the time. Thank you guys very much. Yeah. If, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, if you do have a question, uh, raise your hand and a microphone and wait for a microphone. Uh -huh. Oh, you got one up here, I think. Two. I thought that was extremely interesting. Thank you. A All right. Totally different perspective okay. than I've heard before. All right. Um, First comment I have is uh, that couldn't have been Michelle Obama because she had long sleeves on. Okay. Uh, I didn't even, okay. All right, go ahead, go with your question. And the second uh, is, uh, is I'm not sure if I, if I understood when you were talking about Africa and the fight for, between the communists 
and our country's position saying that we would be, is it that we would be better off if they didn't go to communism or they would be better off if right. we protected them from communism? Right, 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 both. Both, okay. The idea was that they would be better off they would be better off under the yoke of the French and the British right. than under the Soviets. Okay. Because the idea was if they broke off from the French and the, Soviet, the British, it would create a vacuum of power. There was nobody there to, to, to seize power, and the communists would come in. That was the fear. Also, we would be better off. It would allow the United States to have allies. Much of this was also about materials, raw materials, resources. Okay. And, and that became part of the narrative of many civil rights leaders. They said that, you know, again, this will, giving us freedom here in the United States will allow, will, will allow you to bring those other third world countries into the U.S. and Western orbit, and you will be able to benefit off of their resources, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it, it was both. Not only would they be better off, but the United States would be better off. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Thank okay. You. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the assassination of Malcolm X and how that fit into the, to the, uh, to the complex dynamic that was going on between the, you know, the, the, uh, the civil rights and the human rights issue. Right. No, I mean, I think, um, and, I, and I talk about that, um, that's a good question. Um, I talk about that a little bit in the book. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people who've written about um, the assassination of Malcolm and what happened. and. Um, while what happened is less clear, I think why it happened is a little bit more apparent, not necessarily crystal clear, but it's a little bit clearer. And you know, if people who've done the research, um, both the FBI and CIA, they were, travel they were following him throughout his travels, right? And in fact, as I write about in the book, um, State Department uh, memos were written that when he was at the conference of, the Organization of African Unity Conference in Cairo, and he was asking the leaders of the 34 heads of state um, one of them. All, all he needed was one leader to come forward um, and take the case in the United Nations. Because he himself, as an African American, as a person in the United States, they could not take the case, right? And no country could interfere uh, with the internal politics of another country. That's the charter of the UN, right? But another country could raise the question in the General Assembly about the treatment of another country another minority community in a country, right? And so Malcolm was asking at the Organization of African Unity Conference for this, right? And he passed out information, and he talked about the recent passage of the Civil Rights Bill in 64, and he said to them, don't be fooled by this. Don't think that the United States is any different than Europe, right? This was Malcolm's kind of language in terms of he talked about, you know, this wolf in sheep's clothing, you know, narrative. And when you read the State Department memos, um, and even the interviews they were doing openly in the New York Times, they were fearful of this. They felt, and particularly in the State Department memos, that if Malcolm succeeded in getting one country to bring the case of the United States to the United Nations, the U.S. would be seen as a pariah state like South Africa, and they would lose legitimacy not just in the continent of Africa, the United States would, but throughout the Third World. That if they were so, there was a lot of attention and fear that this might succeed. And when you go through these documents, you begin to see how closely surveilled Malcolm was, right? And so his split with the Nation of Islam and the threats that were coming from there internally, but also kind of the pressure that was coming from the state, I think combined, and I think there's a compelling case to be made that you know the NYPD, for example, at the Autobahn Ball, the police officers who were usually there on guard uh, to when he would have his regular OAAU meetings, uh, were not there that day, right? So there was, at the very least, some kind of coordination taking place, right, that led to his assassination. Yeah. Um, you said in the beginning how, like, a lot of Americans just assumed that he was Muslim, Barack Obama, and then you talk about, so I wasn't sure if the point of your book or your work was focused on people's, like, false assumption or how people are just ignorant to like the influence of Muslim in like black empowerment. Like I was a little confused on that. Sure, sure. Probably a little bit of both. Okay. Uh, but I mean, I, I was more raising that example to give you a kind of very visible contemporary example, right? About the kind of anxiety 
not only Islam and Muslims play within the United States today, but in particular when it's associated with blackness, right? Um, and again, not black immigrants from the continent of Africa, West Africans, Caribbeans, right? Uh, but it, it, you know, people, African Americans who grew up here, right? In many ways, I, as I close in my book and I talk about the prison, there's this fear that black Muslims are in many ways the fifth column because they can pass, if you will, as American, right? They have a presence, so, so they can just look normal. I or some immigrant Muslim gets marked as, well, where's he really from, right? Whereas an African-American could just walk around the streets. Yes, they're still subject to all manner of racial profiling. They're still looked at as a threat in some ways, but that their Muslim can be hidden, quote unquote, right? And so there's all this testimony of Alberto Gonzalez and Congress going, taking place where there's, black Muslims are seen as this kind of potential fifth column, right? And all this fear of a kind of gang Islam forming outside of, once they get out of prisons, they're gonna come and affiliate with gangs and then blah, blah, blah. Um, so I was pointing out that example to, to give you a contemporary kind of mark, marker for, for how this fear of, of Muslims is circulating, but especially when it associates with blackness, right? I don't know, does that answer your question? Good, okay. It's a good question though, all right? Anybody else have any questions? All right, no, oh, there's one more over here. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that Dr. King's thinking changed from 1963 to 1967. Right. Could you expound on that, please? Sure. Um, thanks for the question. Um, I think, so if you read, if you, um, his speech that he made at the Riverside Church in, on April 3rd, 1967, I'm pretty sure it was April 3rd, almost a year to the day that he was, the year before, the year to the day before he was assassinated. The speech is called Beyond Vietnam, Breaking the Silence, right? And he talks about it in this speech. What is the silence? What is he talking about, right? What is this silence he's referring to? And what he's referring to is the silence of the civil rights narrative on U.S. imperialism. He's saying for too long, we've been silent on this. And he says this in the speech, when you hear him opening up, my, my advisors, everybody is telling me, Dr. King, do not bring up the question of Vietnam. Do not bring up the question of American imperial power. Don't do that. You will lose support in Congress. You will lose support amongst the populace. And it will not allow us to get the benefits that we're trying to get from the legislator, legislatures and the judicial branches. We will, come, we, we will become pariahs. Look what happened to Du Bois. Look what happened to Robeson. Look what happened to Malcolm. Don't do it, right? And he's saying, morally and ethically, I can no longer be silent. I have had to be silent on US intervention throughout the Cold War, and Vietnam has exposed too many contradictions because he, as he says in the speech, when I go to the ghettos in Chicago, for example, and I tell them not to be violent. He says, the youth come back at me with, well, America is violent every time she wants to solve her problems. And not only that, they're asking us, black men, to go fight over there for her. So, and King was saying, in a very kind of confessional way, I have no way of addressing this. This is a contradiction. This is a hypocrisy, if you will, in my own thinking. So I have to speak out against it. And it's a beautiful speech. You know, and you can hear kind of this kind of confessional tone coming out of King in the speech. He, he's admitting he's wrong. And he says in the speech, he says, um, you know, America is the biggest purveyor of violence in the world. This is Dr. King in 67. This is not the King that celebrated I have a dream, right? He says that America must listen to those that it calls enemy. It must listen to them. They, they may have something to say about the United States that needs reflection and transformation. He says, because if America doesn't listen to those that it calls enemy, its epitaph will read Vietnam, right? And, and King makes this speech in a packed Riverside church. And again, it's all online, you can hear it, right? And it's a very moving speech because it's a very profound moment in the struggle. Right? And this is why some have argued that Malcolm X, after Mecca, became more like King, 
As I talk about in the book, sorry, as I talk about in the book, it's actually the exact opposite. King became more like Malcolm. He became the anti-imperialist. And of course then, King, prior to, six, prior to that speech, King was the number one or number two most popular and favorite American in all the polls. After that speech, he drops to the most hated, clearly. And then a year later, he's assassinated. Because as King talked about, he said, we have to tie racism to militarism to economic inequality. We have to see these as the kind of trifecta of American power. And they have to all be addressed simultaneously. And in the past, the civil rights movement wasn't addressing that. Right? We may have addressed the question of race to the extent that you can disentangle them. Right? But black people still can, just because you can sleep in a hotel, as Malcolm would say, doesn't mean you can afford to pay for the hotel, right? He doesn't address inequality. So, so King was coming to this point and he, this beyond Vietnam speech in many ways crystallized his thinking there. So I hope that addresses your question, yeah. All right. You got a question over here? Uh, I found the, the chapter on Muhammad Ali particularly fascinating because it, of course it's, and, and I, I guess to a certain extent the Dianne Feinstein comments at the beginning of the book do the same thing. This notion that there's an appropriation of a kind of uh, counterculture mm -hmm. idea or a subculture uh, idea that's different from the mainstream, and then it gets appropriated by the mainstream and made safe. Okay. And of course, this is something that goes on in cultural studies, and people sure. talk about it in terms of youth culture and so on. I wonder, all of the album covers you showed using Malcolm X, mm -hmm. all of the, the Spike Lee film, mm -hmm. um, I wonder if by using that image frequently, there's a risk that the, the kind of protest image that uh, Malcolm has gets lost. Right. And closely tied to that, I wonder also about hip hop. And I mean, back in the day, of course, you know, Public Enemy was, was, uh, was fighting pretty, the power. Was fighting the power and was right. controversial, and we weren't going to Arizona anytime soon and all of this. <laughs> Um, I wonder now that hip hop albums are purchased primarily by middle class white uh, young men, if hip hop itself is losing that that kind of political uh, relevancy as well in the same way. Sure. No, great questions. Great questions. Um, you no, know, I think you know, in regards to your first question, um, you know, when it came to Spike Lee's Malcolm X, I mean, this became the critique of many from you know particularly the black left, Baraka and a whole host of people who said, you're commodifying Malcolm. I mean, Malcolm X hats were the style. You wore a Malcolm X hat. You wore a hat with an X on it. Malcolm X teacups, T-shirts. I mean, Malcolm X was everywhere. It became a kind of cottage industry in a way, right, that Spike kind of commodified in a particular way. And in many ways, as, as they argued, many of those critics argued, was like, you're stripping Malcolm of his context and history. People are just going to now wear an X hat but know nothing about Malcolm X. And in fact, many of their concerns prove true when you actually watch the film. Because the film in many ways strips Malcolm of his internationalist politics. Right? It's very good in some ways of identifying Malcolm within the context of the United States. But when it, goes, when it comes to Malcolm's travels abroad, it's very cursory brushstroke stuff and it almost comes off in this kind of colorblind universalism. Oh, I sat down and ate with somebody who was white here in Mecca, right? It was, it's this very kind of like, almost like, you know, a uh, transcendent kind of Malcolm. And I, I think many were critical of the film justifiably. I was in the book as well that it, and you know, Bell Hooks and many other, uh, other scholars also pointed out that like, that wasn't the real Malcolm. Malcolm became more of a pan-Africanist after Malcolm, Mecca, more of an anti-racist after Mecca, after leaving the nation of Islam. And Spike's film doesn't give justice to that. And so that was clearly the fear, that Malcolm would be stripped of his real politics, right? And I think you can say, to get to your second question, um, the same could be said about hip hop in a way, right? That um, it has been commodified to a point that, you know, and, and I teach a class on it. You know, I, I teach the class. <laughs> I, I've ultimately done what many of my uh, colleagues in the English and comparative literature departments do now, I periodize it, right? Like the same way that they do the British novel, I periodize hip hop now. Now I say 85 to 94, the golden age or something like that, right? Um, and I do that for a couple of reasons. One, because I know it so well. It's hard for me to listen to hip hop today, right? For the most part, I still do, but for the most part I can't, 
right? Um, so who am I to speak and teach about it, right? Um, but that era, I also point out, um, is in order to understand where, where, what hip hop is today, you have to understand where it came from, right? And so that um, when, during that era, it came out of a very, kind, it cut its kind of, like kind of political teeth on a particular set of ideas that were about a kind of black nationalism, kind of anti-racism, a kind of internationalism as well, speaking against the war on drugs and the war on crime, right? Um, I was just reading a story recently that Davey D had put out. Um, he's a hip hop journalist out of the Bay Area in Oakland. And he was talking about this meeting that took place in the 80s where um, many of the MCs got together and decided, we're not gonna wear the, the dookie, the gold chains anymore. We're not gonna wear those anymore. In fact, we're all gonna now start wearing Africa medallions. That became also part of the style, an Africa medallion, because of Mandela and the South African struggle. The US was still supporting the South African regime, and these hip hop artists got together, very popular hip hop artists, they said, we're not gonna represent the gold because where's the gold coming from? Where's the diamonds coming from? It's coming from the continent of Africa. We're not gonna wear that anymore. And it was just a really telling moment to me um, about where hip hop was and kind of how it's come today. That's not to say that hip hop back in the day wasn't about being commodified and it wasn't about social mobility. It was from its very inception, you know, the message, it's all about money in this land of milk and honey, right? Run DMC would talk about my Adidas, right? They were, they were rapping about their clothes. Like it wasn't under, I mean, hip hop was an implicitly political art form, but it was also about social mobility. It was about coming up, about getting out of these conditions that you were in, right? But I think as you rightly pointed out, Eric, that that now the majority of consumers of hip hop are, it's a white audience. And so hip hop has to appeal to that in many ways. And for the most part, that's what it's doing, right? But there are artists, and some of them I pointed out, who are still kind of uh, doing it differently. You know, I think Lupe, um, I mean, I think Yasin is, um, Odyssey, Immortal Technique, Jaziri X, you know, there's a whole host of artists that are still, do, but they're not the dominant, they're on the margins now. So I, I agree with you that hip hop has kind of transformed or kind of lost a sense of itself. But I still hold out hope with these other artists that are doing it, yeah. Mary, you still have a question? That'll be our last question with okay. Mary. Hi, I actually have uh, two questions that, again, pertain to hip hop. Hip -hop. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, how hip hop has influenced young people in Muslim countries mm -hmm. um, or places like France where there's a large um, North African population um, that again is experiencing a lot of the, the, the racism and xenophobia that African Americans experienced. And then my, this, my second question is just what was your, who's your favorite hip hop artist and why? <laughs> okay. Um, I'll try and avoid that second one, it's a tough one. Um, Hip hop abroad, I mean, it definitely. I mean, it's become in many ways kind of that voice of, I don't like the word voiceless because everyone has a voice, but the silenced, right? Um, so, you know, uh, a friend of mine, Jackie Saloom, she wrote about hip hop in Palestine. It's called Slingshot Hip Hop. It's a documentary that shows, and the, and, and the MCs at the very beginning are talking about how they grew up listening to Tupac Shakur and Public Enemy and how that, along with Mahmoud Darwish's poetry, kind of helped shape their political imagination, right? Um, and you see it all over the world. I mean, it's taking place in immigrant communities in Europe, but also the continent of Africa, I mean, Latin America. You know, you can see, I mean, Kanan is an MC also, who's also here, who's Muslim, but he talks about growing up in kind of war-torn, ravaged country, right? Um, and, you know, the second largest producing country in the world for hip hop is France. I mean, you pointed it out. And it's all North and West Africans that are doing it. And the great film that I love to show in my class is a film called La Haine, or Hate. It came out in 1995. And it's kind of this touch-tone film, kind of the way in which Spike's Do the Right Thing is here in the United States for the hip-hop generation. Um, but it, it kind of it, it, it underscores these issues. And it has a song in there uh, by a group, uh, uh, Supreme NTM. Um, uh, that was they, that they made um, kind of akin to NWA's kind of after police song, um, and they got put in, they got banned and punished and criminalized for it, and and so clearly, you know, you go to London, you see the same thing. So I mean, hip hop has become the, it's, it, you know, 
all you need is a microphone, one mic, as, my, as Nas said, one mic and something to say. It's a very democratic art form in a way, right? And it lends itself to being spread easily. You don't need instruments and drums and guitars and, right? I mean, tech sampling technology has gotten a little bit, you know, cheaper and less expensive so people can do it. But it allows, it, there's, a, there's a kind of inherently democratic impulse to it that I think allows for it to spread. And you see its appeal throughout the world. I mean, I think it's undeniable. Um, what was your second question? Oh. <laughs> I know what it was. I was just kidding. Um, <laughs> that's a tough question. My favorite MC now or of all time? Wow. Uh, I, I can't name one. I could probably name four or five uh, in no particular order. Um, Lauren Hill, Chuck D, Nas, uh, Rakim, uh, maybe Karis One. I would say maybe Kar. I was about to say probably Karis One. Yeah, those would be my five favorite in no particular order. So, well, thank you very much. All right, thank you guys.